I am recording the meeting. One moment, get everything set up here. Like that. Let's do this. Okay. Uh, you're probably seeing the uh, presenter screen, is that correct? Yes, yes. Okay, and this should be right on target. Are we ready? Ready to rock and roll? Yep. yep. Okay, very good. One moment. Okay, I think we're set. <clears throat> so I'd like to welcome everyone to the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center Integrative Diagnostic Medicine Case Conference for 5-28-2021, the last conference of May. And here we go. Uh, we're going to start out uh, just a warm up here of the neuro term of the week, and it's always case based in this conference. So uh, let, let's take a quick look at this uh, patient is a 59 year old male, lower back pain worsening over the last several months accompanied by radiating pain to the lower extremities. And let's do this. Just for those who are unfamiliar with uh, imaging, you can um, you can see uh, where, where, where the lesion is and what's going on. Uh, do, we, do we want to have a, <clears throat> do we have a um, anyone who wants to unmute and, and describe what we're seeing here on sagittal and axial sequences? How about one of our one of our radiologists, neuroradiologist or non neuroradiologist? Yeah, there's a, a rounded intradural uh, mass uh, at uh, one two level. Uh, it looks like it's uh, intradural but extra medullary. It's towards the left side, uh, and the nerve roots, uh, cotyquine, are being pushed towards the right. Yeah, that that's that's perfect. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, here we go. Let's see. Um, one brief note: you can see that there's also a disc bulge. We got a disc bulge going there, and you can actually see <clears throat> a little group of the roots. That are being trapped. That left arrow between the disc bulge uh, and the uh, and the mass. Okay, let's go to the op note. Uh, there were multiple fascicles of adher uh, multiple fascicles adherent to the tumor capsule that appeared as omphasage. These omphasage fascicles were stimulated low level, revealed EMG activity proximal muscles left leg. Such we proceed to resect the tumor. If there was only a small amount of capsule adhering to the fascicles. We stimulated the fascicle appeared to be that appeared to enter and exit the tumor, which revealed no EMG. Uh, signal even at high current, this was bipolar and cut on both proximal and distal. We carefully dissected any visualized tumor that was adherent to the omphasage roots. And after completion of the dissection, there were no, uh, was no grossly identifiable residual. All right, so <clears throat> diagnosis, uh, here we go, lumbar cistern, schwannoma, dovitro grade one. Uh, here's my comment, H&E stained sections, interop smear and frozen show characteristic more like features of schwannoma. Diagnosis congruent with pre-op imaging studies from the referring institution available on MDAC EPIC, which shows circumscribed elliptical mass, lumbar cistern. There's the measurements. I did not copy those measurements from a radiology report. I measured the tumor myself. It's very easy to do. Anyone can do this modern software. It's not, it's not rocket science. And I give, I, and I also, it's very good form to give exactly which dimensions you're talking about, craniocaudal, anterior, posterior, transverse. There's different abbreviations, but all pretty three dimensions, okay? Uh, there we go. And I'm also specifying which series that I measure those on. So anyone who, who you know, that, that, that's, that's called attention to detail. Okay, anyway. Um, the pre-op uh, imaging impression schwannoma was confirmed interoperably by the patient's neurosurgeon. And I've anonymized uh, the, the neurosurgeon's name, right? Okay, who observed the tumor to be Hey, wait a minute. I anonym did I question? Did I anonymize the patient's neurosurgeon's name? Someone unmute and tell me if I anonymized the patient's neurosurgeon's name. Yes or no? Yes. No. <laughs> no. You just redacted. No, 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 no. That's it. Uh, does anyone know the the, the neurosurgeon? Oh, look, look, here's what you do. Think, just think about it for just a second. What, all I did is put a white box over it. All I did is put a white box over the name. That's all I did, which was really a mistake. Why? Can you see how many letters there would be that are covered by that white box? How many letters? Okay. <laughs> That's, yes. yes. And, and, and it's going to be DR period doctor. And then you fill in the rest. You can count the number of spaces. And then you simply go to the MD Anderson website and you look at the Department of Neurosurgery 
and you see <laughs> now maybe there's two neurosurgeons that have you know four letters or five letters in their last name i don't think that's the case you could at least narrow it down okay now look that's called that's, that's observation and deduction that's sherlock holmes that's what we do here so you know what honestly i think i i, I can declare this conference over because that was the point is the minute I said I have anonymized the name, your brain should have been thinking, I want to know who this patient's neurosurgeon is. Can I figure it out from the date I have? And you'd be looking at it. You'd be looking at that space and you'd be thinking, you know, I bet what this guy did. I bet all he did is just put a white box with, with a white outline over it. That's all he did. He didn't alter it in any other way. So the number of spaces is going to be doctor and a name. You can figure out exactly how many characters. See, that is what we do in this conference. That is the point of the conference. It's not to show you a picture of a schwannoma or a meningioma or classical glioblastoma. There's no point in that. I would not attend this conference. Everybody got that? Do you like that? Wow. W what a way to start a case. Where are you going to get stuff like that in any other clinical conference at this institution? <laughs> You're not. <laughs> okay, let's move on. Observed uh, to be originated from called equina with several roots adherent en passant. Wait, I thought it was en passage. That says en passant. <laughs> See, op noted for complete details. Okay, so here we go, en passant. Neuro term of the week, it's actually two different terms. They mean exactly the same thing. It's just your preference. En passage, en passant. All right, let's go to a uh, guide to peripheral and cerebrovascular, uh, cerebrovascular intervention, intracranial AV malformations. The angiographic anatomy of AV is quite complex. A variable number of arteries may feed the nidus with two patterns of supply. The splying artery either directly terminates in the nidus or sends feeders or twigs to the nidus while the main trunk continues on to supply normal brain distal to the branch point. The latter vessels are known as en passage or vessel in passage feeders. So the vessel that's supplying the ABM is gonna do its thing. It's gonna supply the brain, whatever normal area it's headed for, but on the way, en passant, while it's passing, it sends some feeders into this vascular malformation. That's how the vascular malformation lives. The presence of an en passage, it's clinically relevant, why? The presence of an en passage arterial supply carries a higher risk of post-treatment, surgical intervascular treatment, ischemic neurological deficits. This is because of the risk of injury embolization to the parent vessel. Superselective angiography of, uh, of single predict pedicles of AVMs with multiple feeders, very helpful with this technique. It's possible to demonstrate whether a single feeder supplies one uh, portion or compartment, they, or if it receives blood supply, multiple feeders. The presence of single feeding pedicles increases the probability of successful occlusion of that portion of the AVM. All right, let's go to a, a different paper, same thing. This is uh, European radiology, all right? So we're bringing radiology into the mix, 2010, partial targeted embolization of brain AVMs. Concerning the nature of the feeding artery, there are two basic types of feeding arteries. Direct arterial feeders end in the AVM. Indirect arterial feeders supply the normal cortex and also supply the AVM en passage via small vessels that arise from the normal artery, while direct feeders are safe targets for an endovascular therapy on passage feeders. They carry the risk of inadvertent arterial blue migration uh, to distal healthy vessels. So, neuro term of the week, en passage and en passant. All right, let's go to etymology, online, Etymology Dictionary, I go to this resource all of the time. French, literally in passing, from the present participle of passer to pass, all right, in reference to chess. And that's what I'm, I'm guessing that at least a few people in this audience, when I said en passant, the first thing you thought of is the chess move, all right, which first appears in written words, 1818. All right, en passant, let's go again to the, the source of all human knowledge, Wikipedia, <laughs> en passant, is a move in chess. It is a special pawn capture that can only occur immediately after a pawn makes a move of two squares from the starting square. It could have been captured by an enemy pawn if it only advanced one square, because that would be a diagonal capture. The, the opponent pawn uh, uh, captures the just move pawn as it passes through the first square. The result is the same as if the pawn had just advanced only one square and an enemy pawn had captured it. The en passant, listen, this is important. The en passant capture must be made on the very next turn. In other words, you advance your pawn two squares to avoid the one square capture, right? And you think that you're safe because now you're parallel to that pawn, but the opposing player must see that. And instead of moving any piece anywhere else on the board, that the opposing player must capture it on the next turn or the move stands. It's not a capture, right? Okay, what does that sound like? Does that ring a bell to another game that I'm sure someone in this audience, probably many people play? 
Yes, it's Uno. <laughs> Before playing your penultimate card, you must say Uno. If you don't say Uno and another player catches you with just one card before the next player begins their turn, you must pick four more cards from the draw file. Can you imagine the horror? <laughs> yes, Uno. Uno and chess, basically the same game. All right, the Ampasite catcher must be made very next turn, right? To do so is lost. It prevents a pawn from using the two square advance to pass an enemy pawn without the risk of being captured because the creators of chess, we'll talk about in just a second, did not want that to be a possibility. All right. So here's what we're talking about. Look at the board. White's move. White's move. And you can see advancing the pawn on the left, two squares, which would put it directly opposite of the, 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 the A5 black pawn and parallel to the B4 pawn. In other words, safe. But if the opposing player recognizes that, all they have to do is make the simple diagonal move right into the A3 position, and bye-bye, that's the en passant capture, all right? Uh, it, when was it added? 1400s. It was added in the 15th century when the rule gave pawns an initial double move. Before that, it was a single. You could only, pawn could only advance one at a time. 1400s, okay, let's give them the two-square advance, going to move the game along, but they did not want it to be a way to bypass capture. So you cannot do this safely if there is a pawn that we could, could do this diagonal pass. It prevents a pawn from using a two-square advance to pass in jump. Because the creator said, no, we don't want that to happen. We'll give you two square moves. We don't want that to happen. All right, so that's that's en passant. Okay, let's go to the University of Texas Synapse web. I'm sure everyone's familiar with this. No, I'm sorry. I'm sure no one is familiar with this website. All right, here we go. Axon dendrite cell body and look at the boutons. See, these are the synapses. Now, usually you think of an axon terminating, right, on another axon or a muscle, the end effector, and that's the synapse, right? The long axon the synapse. But actually synapses can occur along the full length of the axon and those are called boutons en passant. Right? So that is the application in neuroscience, the little boutons. See all along the sides of the axons. All right, so neuro term of the week, en passage, en passant. You see how the term was adopted, co-opted, was co-opted, if you, if you will, by the neurosurgeon to describe these nerve, the, the roots of the cardiac quina, which were adherent, adherent to the capsule, if you will, this fibrosis of the schwannoma as they were passing through to, to innervate the muscles where, where they're going. So they were, they were basically nerve fascicles en passage or en passant, and they could be safely dissected off. Only the nerve that gave rise to the tumor was so entrapped uh, with, with no, no, uh, no left activity, uh, the EMG, so that they could, uh, you could safely uh, uh, take it. All right, one more thing about the etiology. We're not warmed up, we're not finished with this case yet. You know, we're, we're, Frequently, we're never finished with a case. There's always more, but unfortunately, many of us, myself included, miss it. We totally miss it because we look at the slides, we look at the scans, we go to a snap diagnosis, and we miss so much that is interesting because we go brain dead. And that's not what it should be, certainly not in academic medicine. All right, there are two sources of compression in this particular instance. There's this disc bulge, which on its own would not be even close to enough to uh, compress the caudal equine and lead all those symptoms. But you put a mask right there at that spot, trap those fascicles, look at that. Is that a thing of beauty or not? But look, the problem is it's not just the schwannoma that's doing that. There are two sources. Well, that's, that's an exception to Occam's razor. Occam's razor basically says, let's explain all the signs and symptoms with one disease. This patient actually has two diseases, if you will. It's got the disc bulge and exactly at the, I will call it, is, is it the wrong place, the wrong time, or the right place, the right time? There's a schwannoma opposite, trap those fascicles, okay? Question, who's, that's what Occam, Occam said, basically, basically what it boils down to is the simplest explanation, <clears throat> i.e. one disease in medicine. The simplest explanation is likely to be correct. That's what Occam's, razor boils down to in our world. Whose law, there's another guy, says that, well, you know, actually, it's really common to have more than one source, more than one disease that's explaining all of these signs and symptoms. It's like the counterpoint to Occam's razor. Whose law was that? Anyone want to unmute and tell me that, or, that already knows? What was his name? All right, time's up. Pick him. Okay, this is the point of the conference. I imagine there's a ton of people attending that know Occam's razor. And if you, if you don't, this is a wonderful thing because now you know Occam's razor. All right, it, 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 you, you could do a title search in PubMed, limit it to the title and tons, tons of papers in medicine dealing with Occam's razor and that sort of thing. Hickam, okay, 
Uh, some of the sources say it was an actual physician. They talk about wearing warts, et cetera, et cetera. Others say it's apocryphal that, that, that he, that, you know, it's not real. I don't care. It doesn't matter. The principle is what matters. It's called Hickam's dictum, hmm? if you've not heard of it. All right, uh, let's go to clinical medicine 2020, very current images of the month. Unexpected neurological comorbidity. comorbidity. What does that mean? That's more than one morbid condition, more than one disease, more than one thing at play. Occam's razor or Hickam's dictum, all right? And all it was was an example of a patient who had uh, an ischemic infarct, which you see on the left, and a calcified meningioma. So it's like two different diseases. So Hickam's dictum says, yeah, this is not rare. So for all the symptoms, all the symptoms this patient was having, some of them may have been due to compression of the underlying cortex due to this sizable meningioma. Others were due to the ischemic infarct. So this patient had multiple symptoms. They could not all be explained by either of these single diseases. So the explanation was the patient did in fact have two diseases. All right, let's look, let's look at the paper. Introduction, finding the correct diagnosis in clinical neurology can sometimes be compared to the working method of Sherlock Holmes. I know we talked about Mycroft Holmes, which is Sherlock Holmes, seven year older brother, smarter brother, I think in the last conference. To his repertoire skills like competence of observation, we need that, don't we, diagnostic medicine physicians? Whether you're radiologist, pathologist, you have to have competence of observation. You have to observe. You can't fly through it. You can't latch on to one detail, satisfaction of search, and go brain dead. All right? You cannot do that. You're not going to be successful. Reasoning, okay, and special knowledge. Okay, competence of observation, one. Then reasoning, can, do you understand the significance of what you are seeing. Can you tie it all together? Like we were talking about the anonymization of the neurosurgeon's name. Did, did, did you see that? Did you observe it? Did you think about it? Did you have the intellectual curiosity to challenge me when I said I've anonymized that name? That is what it's all about in diagnostic medicine. You have to have intellectual curiosity. You have to have skepticism. You have to question everything and base your diagnoses on facts, okay? And look at the third, confidence of observation, reasoning, and special knowledge. All right, that's why, that's why you have spent all this time in medical school, residency, fellowship, is acquiring the knowledge base, acquiring the knowledge, and it never ends. I'm not there. I'm not even close to being there. You know why? Because there's about a month that's gone by and I haven't read enough of the papers that have come out in the literature. None of us are there. This, your special knowledge must continue to accrue or you will be superannuated before you know it. All right, thinking tools like Occam's razor or Hickam's dictum may be, may be added to explain clinical signs and symptoms. Occam's razor brings a focus single explanation for a number of complaints. Hickam's dictum, by contrast, delineates there is many diseases that the patient reports as most likely to explain the clinical condition. Way, the way it's usually phrased is Hickam's dictum says the patient can have as many diseases as they mm, mm, want, as many diseases as they want. <laughs> that, that's the way. It's kind of a, a humorous phraseology. Okay. This is the way uh, I, the, the legendary late Dr. Norman Leeds, um, one of the founders of the American Society of Neuro, uh, Neuroradiology. This is the way he, was, he would always say if the patient has ticks and fleas, when we had a situation where a patient did have, have two diseases. Uh, in Europe, my good friend, um, Dr. Peter Wesseling in the Netherlands, the way he said, we have another phrase in the Netherlands, bitten by a dog and a cat, okay? Now, the irony of that statement is when I uh, was staying and my wife and I were staying with uh, Peter uh, Wessling in, in the Netherlands on one of the trips, I was actually bitten by his cat. Uh, unfortunately, he did not have a dog, so I could not be also bitten by his dog. That would have made a, a wonderful story. All right, Hickam's, Hickam's dictum. Let's look at the MD Anderson case here. This is just from, from my little collection, my tiny little collection, uh, totally uh, anecdotal, if you will. I want you to try it. All right, Hickam's dictum, more than one disease. What do we see? All right, we, we don't have time to, you know, to do the, the whole thing here, but okay, meningioma and pituitary adenoma. All right, I'm gonna try another one, different patient. What's this gonna be? Hmm, meningioma and vestibular schwannoma, right? Okay, you wanna try another one? How about this? Gliomatosa cerebri, we see the diffuse glioma, this T2 flare. All right, it's gonna be in the right temporal lobe. You can see from, from the amygdala, hippocampal, medium going back, all that T2 flare stuff. Gliomatosa cerebri is, is what it was if you had all the sequences. And again, the pituitary adenoma, see that solid uh, T2 hyperintense mass filling the cella. All right, and we'll try this one. Kind of a variation. 
Arachnoid cysts, that's of the right temporal pulse, single most common location. And that was a, turned out to be a glioblastoma uh, in the left temporal lobe. What's the common theme so far in all of these two diseases? The common theme is everything I'm showing you are common. They're, they are among the most common diseases or findings. Uh, you know, you don't have to call an arachnoid cyst. That's, that's, a, that's just an incidental finding. It's not a disease. They're among the most common, and that's statistically most likely that a patient might have two of the most common. So far, I haven't seen you shown you a really rare thing, but those do occur as well, a rare, rare with, with, with a common. Two really rare occurring together, the odds are way against that. Sure, it can happen, but st statistically very uncommon. All right, how about this one? This is kind of a fun. Uh, someone want to unmute and tell me what the diagnosis is in the uh, left frontal lobe? What's that in the left frontal lobe? Everyone recognizes diffuse glioma in the uh, right parietal lobe. What's what's that in the uh, in the in the left left frontal posterior left frontal? Cavernoma. Uh, no, yeah, cavernoma, absolutely, cavernous malformation. Good job. So this is a diffuse astrocytoma and a cavernous malformation. Absolutely, yes. All right, and here let's do another one. Okay, again, look at that pituitary adenoma. <laughs> and you have to be able, to, by, by the way, you know, you have to be able to recognize that that is the cellar region where this big, this is a macro adenoma filling that cellar region. You have to be able to identify it on an axial, not just on a, on a coronal or a sagittal, which are our favorite series for looking at pituitary adenomas because we see the cellar and the supracellar space together, right? We really love that. But you have to be able to recognize it on an axial and you have to be able to recognize it on a T2, not just on a T1 with a, with a hypo enhancing air, yada, yada, right? Okay. And and that arachnoid cyst of the left temporal pole is much bigger on other cuts. It's just, I, I like to show just the one cut that's effective, but I can't show you one cut on all the patients. So how about this one? I had to use two different cuts. So this is the same patient with a, a, a sagittal um, a T1, and then you can see the um, uh, uh, T1 post, which is back further. And of course, it's a pituitary adenoma and a vestibular schwannoma. All right, how about this one? Okay, pretty obvious. Again, both of these lesions have appeared several times in this short little series of meningioma uh, and an arachnoid cyst. Okay, so that's just, uh, that's just, I just put those together. I could have shown more. I thought we'll just cut it off right there. It is actually relatively common. So Hickam's, Hickam's dictum is not fanciful, it's very real. It's very real and you should watch for it. Uh, one of the others that I did not show, uh, which I, I need to add it to, to the collection is all the time, listen, all the time, I usually do not spot these myself because I'm not good enough, I don't have the eye, but our neuroradiologist very commonly will spot incidental, tiny, saccular aneurysms, berry aneurysms of some portion of the cir circle of Willis. And they will say incidental you know, aneurysm, what, two millimeters, three millimeters, little thing like that is identified all the time. And if you go back and if you look at the outside, the referring institution radiology reports, it's not there. It takes an expert eye to recognize that. I always think that's a thing of beauty and I always find it um, and I need to include that in the series and I will in the future. Again, <clears throat> relatively common. Okay, let's moving on to the uh, the triptych, uh, imaging triptych of the week. We talked about what a triptych was, basically three three paintings, three glass, uh, stained glass windows, et cetera, et cetera, triptych. Here we go, 44 year old male. Somebody wanna unmute and give me a differential diagnosis. No, it's early. How about just an imaging description? Uh, this, uh, you know, uh, thing that catches my eye is that there's a cell. Uh, okay, you've, uh, you've, been, you've, been talking, you've been talking for 30 seconds now. <laughs> pineal region mass. Yes. Uh, leptomeningeal metastasis. I'm thinking germ cell tumor. I top like of my personal I, diagnosis. I, I love that. Okay, keep going. The patient's male. That works. Uh, do you like it for germinoma in a 44 year old? Uh, yes. No, definitely. no. Yes, it could be. It absolutely could be. I would like it a lot better if this patient were 18 or 19 or 20 or 21 or 22. Think young male would be perfect, but that's okay. That's okay. 44 is fine and it's male and it's pineal. And the most common is going to be germinoma, the most common tumor of the pineal region germinoma. And it absolutely does disseminate. So good. Now, remember it's always a differential, right? So give me the other entities after germinoma. What's coming, what is coming next? Again, 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 statistically, most likely based on all the data and you have what, four data spheres. You have age, gender, 
anatomic location and imaging characteristics. Why don't you bring in age? Why don't you bring in the age 44 and give me a likely diagnosis for a 44 year old patient with a pineal region tumor? Put, bring in the age. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and, uh, you know, uh, tap out early. I'm, I'm okay. still <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for playing. I admire your courage. And I really like your, <laughs> I really like you bringing in the MMA and the octagon, which, you know, the, the eight, the, the eight sphere uh, diagram. All right. That, that, thank you. All right, anyone else want to play? After germanoma, what are the other entities in the differential? Is pinoblastoma in 44 year olds? I don't know. No, no, that's good. Thank you. Thank you. No, that's good. Yes. This is what we're talking about. The answer is no, and, and, but, but that's part of it. No, it's PPTID. Pineal parenchymal tumor intermediate differentiation is the single most common PPT, pineal parenchymal tumor, and 40, 44, 45 years old, middle-aged adult is perfect age for a PPT ID, which is, which is the most common. Pineoblastoma is typically childhood. Now, can, can this be pineoblastoma for, yes, of course, it, if this patient was 80, could it be pineal? Yes, all ages, but statistically PPT ID. Okay, isn't this good? This, this is wonderful. Thank you for volunteering. This conference lives all people speaking up. All right, so here, we'll look at the, the, the sagittal here, almost mid-sagittal mid section, you see the cerebral aqueduct. All right, let, let's, let's, look, let's look at the path. Here's the cytologic smear. And if you kind of gestalt it, and then you look closely, look at these rosettes. And a few of these rosettes, even on the smear, uh, I've highlighted some of them that it's really hard to see, maybe at this magnification, this was 40, we really needed a 60 uh, high dry, which the, the cytopathologists use all the time, we don't have them. Uh, people tend to steal those objectives, they're very extensive, and you, very expensive, you just unscrew it anyway. Uh, story for another time. There are true central lumens in several of these rosettes. That's the Flexner Wintersteiner rosette. Others are others are, are the Homer right. Our Flexner Wintersteiner rosettes are very common. Now, this is the entire specimen, all right? Whole slide imaging. Okay, question. You see, see the scale bar? That's one millimeter, the scale bar. This is it. Actually, there were two pieces. The first piece is what is, is, is the one you just saw here. I used for the smear. The second piece was used for the interoperative frozen section, and this is it. Question, how was this sample obtained? So was it, uh, let's see, let me be, uh, what kind of a craniotomy? You do craniotomy and it's kind of a deep reach. You know, where do you go? What? It was endoscopic. Yes, ma'am, absolutely. Is that Dr. Gilbert? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Gilbert. Yes, the tiniest biopsies we see are endoscopic biopsies. It's so easy. So typically, if the neurosurgeon goes in uh, to, to do um, something like a third ventriculoscopy, ventriculostomy to uh, reduce uh, the, the intracranial pressure, relieve, re relieve the obstructive hydrocephalus. And while they are in there, if the tumor is adjacent to the third ventricle, could be thalamus, you know, could be in this, in this particular case, pineal region, anywhere, if it's bulging or involving third ventricle, while they're, they're doing the procedure to relieve the obstructive hydrocephalus, they simply use the pincers to get a bite of tissue. A, a typical endo endoscopic <clears throat> biopsy is about a quarter or a fifth of, a sing of what would have been a single core of a stereotactic biopsy, they are tiny. We had a case, we had such a case, initial presentation, primary presentation of a tumor, which could be a diffuse, it could be a lot of different things. We must, we needed to have next generation sequencing. Can you get next generation sequencing off of this? Yes, absolutely. And here is how it is done. What you do is you have to cut all the sections now Right, or if it's already in formal, and you have to you have to have the uh, your main histology lab or your T TQL lab, etc. Cut 40, 40 sections at the same time. Then do the screening H and E. If you just let this go, you know, and you wait till tomorrow morning, and the, the, the FFPE block main lab cuts the section. You look at the section, say, oh yeah, I think I know what this is. I need you know I need two immunostains, whatever. They have to remount the block, face it, which means make it level again. All the tissue's gone. You get nothing. You get back. You know, all of your immunostains are just antibody on glass. Everyone understand? You have to protect the patient. We did have exactly this situation, what was it, two, two weeks ago uh, when I was on service. Endoscop not this patient, endoscopic biopsy had to have next generation sequencing to protect the patient, to get all of the data, molecular alteration data needed so that the neuro-oncologist, radio, radiation oncologist could do that. In the community, 
don't you know this is botched all the time? Absolutely. And we see the results when the patient ends up coming to church here care center. But we need to be better than that. That's why we have the Texas Medical Center. That's why we have this conference. And all of you, the people that you're scattered all over the country, scattered all over the world, that's why you come to this conference. That's why we talk about these things. You have to protect your patient. You have to get the sections cut now. It absolutely can be done. Yeah, that's a cautionary tale. You like it? Okay, <clears throat> moving on. Um, here we go. This is the frozen section. Again, very similar to the smear. Uh, you can see if you look closely uh, in, in the center left, left half, uh, ro rosettes kind of begin popping out. Uh, here's something you can see the big black dot uh, was to identify this focus. Again, this frozen section. That's a little focus of necrosis. Very good. Uh, let's do some immunostain, synaptophycin, four plus positive, look at that, higher power, every single cell, internal negative control of the blood vessels, neurofilament protein, basically nada. All right, there's a few little blotches there. What we're looking for is positivity in the cytoplasm of the tumor cell intimately surrounding the nucleus. That says that that tumor cell is expressing neurofilament proteins. It's actually a triplet. Everybody knows that's a triplet. I think I originally had this NFP with an S, a little S, neurofilament proteins. Thought that might be confusing, so I took it out. It usually is. The antibodies are usually recognizing uh, all three, at least two, and sometimes all three of the neurofilament proteins uh, in, in, in this. Uh, it's like a, essentially a triple helix. Okay. PHH3, no labeling, very low, relatively low mitotic index, but KI67 in the moderate range. All right, let, here we go. Brain pathology 2000, 21 years ago. These are the Jouvet criteria for grading PPTIDs. This is the Locus Classicus. Locus Classicus, the original paper, the paper everyone refers to. 66, here's the grading criteria. You see grade one, uh, which would be pineocytoma, no mitoses, three plus positive for neurofilament protein by IHC. Grade two and grade three, look at these criteria. Grade two, fewer than six mitoses and positive for neurofilament protein. What about grade three? Well, you put these two uh, uh, above each other, you put those together. So fewer than six mitoses, but if it's very weak or absent neurofilament protein, it bumps it to a three. Or if you have greater than six mitoses, it can have two plus neurofilament protein. That's not gonna save it. It does not trump. The, the neurofilament protein expression does not trump the mitotic activity. If it's six or greater, we'll see. It, it later became, it wasn't greater than, greater than or equal to. I'll show you the evolution. And of course, pineoblastoma is a different animal. All right, fast forward uh, to this uh, future oncology uh, review. All right, and uh, let's see, here we go. Grade two PPTID, look at the neurofilament protein, all right, for the grade two. You see how, it, how it's surrounding the nucleus, the brown individual tumor cells? Look at grade three, very weak. You're not seeing that staining. So grade two versus grade three, neurofilament protein was a key stain. Now, listen, this is not official WHO grading. It is mentioned in the WHO, but it, it essentially, because it's based on a single immunostain, um, the group was uncomfortable uh, uh, canonizing this, all right, Codif formally codifying it, but it is used all of the time. And you can use it. You simply cite the Juve criteria, right? Okay. And we, we do it as well. All right. So here, uh, again, from, th from that paper, uh, again, you can see the low grade, high grade. Uh, I think this one's even worse in terms of confusing. Uh, look at the mitotic figures for the high grade. It's like less than six or greater than equal to six and plus minus and double plus. That's really confusing. I really, this is from Peter Berger's wonderful uh, atlas. With, he invited several co-authors to join him. This is very clear. Criteria for grade two, fewer than six mitoses per 10 high power fields. Now notice, Fewer than six can also be grade three, but you have to have the absence of, of NFP, all right? And then the, um, the criteria for grade two, six mitoses, the greater than or equal to, six mitoses per 10 puts it into grade three, done and done. There can be fewer, and if it's weak immune reactivity for neurofilament, it goes to grade three, and that is, listen, that is exactly our patient. There were fewer than six mitoses. I showed you the PHH3, right? So mitotic figure immunostain, but the neurofilament protein was essentially stone cold negative. That bumped it to a three and it certainly fits with the, with the dissemination. All right, so the diagnosis in this case, 44 year old male, beautiful age for this PPTID grade three. Uh, we have to uh, acknowledge the, uh, of course, methylation profiling <laughs> and, and modern uh, genetic uh, parameters. However, the genomic alterations 
um, are, are, are not altering right now treatment for PPTID. Everything I've shown you is all you really need. Okay, just the basic immunostains. Let's look at, uh, at this paper just very quickly vis-a-vis -vis the age. All right, this is pine the pineoblastoma and it includes the, the retinoblastoma like pineoblastoma, that's the pen RB at the far right. This is pineoblastoma, all the different molecular uh, groups, methylation groups, including the MIC group, Okay, retinoblastoma group, as I mentioned, look at the age, all right, 10 years old or even younger for the MIC altered and the retinoblastoma group. Childhood, so pineoblastoma, primarily childhood. Now, they absolutely do occur in adults, even older adults, right? This is just one particular study. We're talking about what's most common. All right, here are, is the PPTID. The reason why it's an A and a B, again, this is methylation profiling. Methylation profiling separates into an A and a B. Right now, there's no clinical, clinically actionable difference. So we don't really separate it. It's not necessary to separate them. And again, it is the most common tumor. Look at the age, the mean, just look, the mean for the, the group A, just above 40 years. And for uh, the group B up around 50, that sort of thing, maybe a little less in the 40s. That's why 44 years old, that's what I was looking for when I was saying after, you know, after germinoma, single most common tumor, after that, what fits with a 44 year old patient? Oh, PPTID. And it is much more common. All right, this is not showing absolute numbers, but you, much more common than pineoblastoma or pineocytoma. All right, next group is papillary tumor of the pineal region. Now, this doesn't originate from the pineal gland. It's from this, uh, this remnant of the subcommissural organ, right? That's just anterior uh, to the posterior commissure, right at the adages, the opening of the cerebral aqueduct uh, into the third, third ventricle. But you can see the age range here, age range here is again uh, for the B group. Uh, it's going to be typically young adult is what you might think. And then uh, older young adult going into, in, into early middle age. Uh, for, for the group A. And then finally, here's pineocytoma. Again, pineocytoma, primarily a tumor of older adults. Look at, you see that median bar up there, oh, actually over 50. Uh, I just thought this is very useful, all right? Just looking at the age parameter, because all this other genetics in the paper, and you, you, can, you can look at the paper. Now, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't, of course, show the, the obligatory MD Anderson Cancer Center uh, series. Here we go. Pineal preoperative tumor intermediate differentiation, single institution experience. Uh, pretty recent, Neuro-Oncology Practice 2020. Uh, here you can see just a bottom line, PPTID with neuroaxial dissemination, which is our current patient we're talking about, benefits from aggressive initial treatment, including spinal irradiation and uh, adjuvant uh, chemotherapy, whereas localized disease can be treated traditionally with debulking followed by adjuvant radiotherapy alone. And listen, how common, listen, how common is it for PPTID to present with disseminated disease? Well, in our little series of 17 patients here, there were three out of 17 that had dissemination. And all of these, of course, it's only biopsy. You cannot resect LMD. So for obvious reasons, so you don't even try and there's no point in debulking uh, 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 the disease when it's already, uh, already at the LMD um, um, uh, stage. Okay, so 44-year-old mole, PPTID, dissemination. It's a minority of the PPTIDs. It absolutely does occur. Here's an example, aggressive therapy. Everyone like that? And now you know the age range. Oh, this has been a really good case, I think, for everyone. All of us, myself included, need to refresh. I refresh my knowledge base. I have to. You know, what is it? Over 120 different types of primary brain tumors? Man, Yes, and all of this data coming out in the literature every week, I have to refresh my knowledge. All, almost every case I sign out, I have to refresh my knowledge. And you know, our sign out in oncologic neuropathology, I would say is by far the most complex of any sub, subspecialty, including I say hematopathology, gonna be a very close second, but no one has the burden that we do. Virtually every case in oncologic is going to involve next generation sequence and molecular alterations and the imaging. Imaging is in every report that I issue, virtually every report. I usually do not include imaging on removal of a porticath, <laughs> a, me a medical device. Other than that, the imaging is there. Very few specialties do it to that detail for a majority of cases. Uh, we had a good discussion yesterday at the faculty leadership about next generation sequencing, how we're gonna handle it. And Dr. Aisha Sahin, who is our chief of the section of breast pathology, which is, which is an amazing job because there is so much surgery. It's overwhelming for our breast pathologists. We were talking about it and Dr. Sahin said, well, at this stage, very few of our patients have next generation sequencing because it's not driving therapy. It's gonna be ER, PR, and HER2 new. That's what drives the therapy right now. It's very few. 
in neuropathology, it's exactly the opposite situation. The vast majority, we, we have to deal with it and it's only becoming more and more um, uh, common. And that's why we deal with it every week in this conference. Okay, you know what? I think we're warmed up. Everybody ready for patient one? And guess what? I have three patients. I think they're about something like 250. Can I ask a question? Yes, of course, please. Can I ask a quick question? So if, if you see a pineal lesion that's disseminated, is, can you say that it's more likely PPD? PPID, sorry. Uh, yes, uh, right. If, if, if it's disseminated disease, is it more likely to be PPTID if you know it's a PPT? The most common is actually going to be pineoblastoma. And it's, of course, it's going to be more common in children, but pineoblastoma is the single PPT that disseminates most common. So if you, if you don't know age, et cetera, you're going to put pineoblastoma in there. Actually, for, for this particular patient of 44, I would go with germinoma, pineoblastoma, PPTID. I would put all of those in the differential diagnosis. But certainly with dissemination with, with, within, within the uh, PPTID, well, it, it, could, it could actually be a grade two or a grade three, honestly. Uh, this one turned out to be a three, but that's a, that's a great question. All right, pineoblastoma number one for dissemination, PPTID number two, and pineocytoma never disseminates. All right, stays localized, curable by surgery. Thank you, that's a great question. Perfect, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, let's go, patient number one. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you some, some data and then I want a diagnosis, okay? Here's the imaging. Uh, Octavio, was that you earlier that described? Or uh, Dr. Yes. Singh? Yeah, go, go ahead, T tell us what you're seeing. So I see a left parietal, I, I believe left parietal or frontal parietal mass, uh, which has basically at least two or three components. It has diffuse enhancement with a tiny region of necrosis and a large non-enhancing component to it. It's an ill-defined intraparenchymal mass, and it has significant mass effect upon the adjacent structures, which is evidenced by effacement of the lateral ventricle and midline shift. Perfect. Uh, with this very single image, I would say, um, I wouldn't call it like the, 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 the classical IDH wild type glioblastoma because I would expect a more necrosis and a more like well-defined ring of enhancement. I would say that it might be a grade three or grade four IDH mutant glioma maybe, um, but I don't okay. know. Okay, I th okay, thank you, uh, Octavio. Um, that's Octavio Ariola, our oncologic neuroradiology fellow, soon to be the real deal out on his own in practice. That was masterful, Octavio. You have spent your year well with us and you have learned a lot. That is perfect. Okay, that's the, that is a great differential diagnosis based on one, actually two data spheres, anatomic location and frontoparietal in that region and imaging characteristics. Let's look at histology. I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna show you four, four or five or six H and E, uh, histology panels, then I would like to have, uh, we'll call it the revised differential diagnosis. Just going to run through these. I think about one more and one more. And this is the last H&E image. Okay, now I'm going to ask for a diagnosis. Based on that, now you have an additional data sphere. Now you have h &E histology, which on its own is a huge, very important data sphere. Someone unmute and uh, tell me what you think. What did you learn? What did you- Glioblastoma, IDH wild type, WHO grade four. Yes, tell me why. Uh, because there's intravascular fibrin thrombi, which is associated with the IDH wild type status. Absolutely, absolutely. That is exactly correct. Every, everyone appreciate, and this is, I, I mean, look, look how many, they're everywhere. I had no problem. I could have shown you twice as many, three times as many of these, and there's, there's the necrosis, okay? Now, here's the thing. So look, at this point, at this point in the process, the diagnosis is glioblastoma on each wild type, pre -presum presumptive. You'd have to say NOS if you don't have the molecular data, but this is exactly what you put in the comments, most likely to be out each wild type because contrast enhancing and all these intravascular fiber microthrombi, which are strongly associated. Question, are the intravascular fiber thrombi as predictive 
of IDH wild type as a T2 flare mismatch is when it is present, when it is positive for IDH mutant diffuse astrocytic disease? No. If it was, we would be using it in exactly that fashion. It is a very powerful piece of data, but it is not as powerful. All right, let's look at, the, look at this image. Here we go, look at the coronal. Just as Octavia just described it, would you like to see uh, this exact coronal section in a T2 flare? Sure, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here it is. Oh. Oh yeah, there is a T2 flare mismatch sign. Yes, sir, hang on. T1 post, just looking at this particular cut, little blushy enhancement, T2, T2 flare. What do you think? Yeah, I think it, it goes along the, the, the lines now with much more confidence that it is going to be an IDH mutant astrocytoma. Absolutely. Look, if you didn't know before, when you saw this, it is a huge red flag against IDH wild type disease. The intravascular fibrin microthrombi, which were very real and very present in this case, notwithstanding, there are always exceptions. You cannot base or should not base your diagnosis solely on one data sphere. That's the whole point of the eight data sphere model. And I say it over and over again. I thought this was a beautiful case to set a trap, all right, to get everyone to fall into it, to emphasize the point is that you don't, as they say, put all of your eggs in one basket. That's gambling. We do not gamble. All right, let's look at the, uh, the molecular signature, immunophenotype, positive for R132H expression, absolute loss, loss of uh, ATRX, positive strong diffuse 90% P53. That's going to be a TP53 uh, uh, diagnosis. Okay, diagnosis. Here it is astrocytoma, IDH mutant, WCHO grade four. All right, that's the necrosis and the vascular proliferation by the C impact and soon to be CNS5E nomenclature. And then we'll put in lower font. Glioblastoma, IDH mutant grade four, it's still there because we're in the transition period between the 2016 and the forthcoming 2021. And there's the molecular data in the diagnosis line. And here we go, h and &E stain sections show a densely cellular high-grade diffuse astro with striking cellular pleomorphism, anosonucleosis, including bizarre giant cells, multinucleate cells. It's worth describing because it's IDH mutant, but it was truly impressive. It needs to go in there, all right? Additional uh, morphologic features of relevance to traditional Traditional histologic feature-based grading criteria include elevated mitotic activity, microvascular proliferation, intravascular fibrin microthrombi. Wait, shouldn't we just ignore it? Just bury it? Don't put it, don't even put it there. It'll confuse people. Don't we ignore it? Doesn't, don't we ignore any data that doesn't fit with our beautiful little preconceived hypothesis? In graduate school, when I was going through graduate school, working on my PhD, one of the big rules that was beat into me is do not, you formulate hypotheses. That's what we do. We formulate hypotheses in diagnostic medicine. What was beat into me was formulate the hypotheses, don't fall in love with them, don't marry them. Do not fall in love with your hypothesis. It's subject to change with data, use data, use your brain, don't ignore things you do not understand or don't fit. It's in my report. Check this out, which are usually associated with IDH wild type diffuse astrocytic disease and thus constitute an atypical histologic feature in this IDH mutant diffuse astrocytoma. I didn't ignore it. I didn't bury it. It's in the report. I'm stating it as it is. That's interesting. It may become important in the future. Maybe there's some special significance to having widespread everywhere into vascular fiber microthrombi in IDH mutant disease, just like uh, CD... CDK2NAB, right, homozygous deletion, gives a negative prognosis to other, other otherwise well-behaving IDH uh, 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 mutant disease. Maybe this could be. We don't know. Put it in the report. Tell it like it is. All right, and there's and the post necrosis. All right, diagnosis, IDH mutant grade four, congruent with preoperative imaging, show large, complex, I would call this a complex form of T2 flare mismatch, yada, yada, yada. It just talks about the, the enhancement. Uh, a large non-enhancing region of the mass. I didn't show you all the cuts, all the planes, which is about a half to two thirds. Notice the hyphens, one half to two thirds, round to oval nuclei. Anytime you have that language, you can put in the hyphens. Uh, that, that punctuation helps a reader to read, to understand and read quickly and understand the meaning. What is the point of punctuation? You know, commas, semicolons, all of that. Was it just to torture grade school children? No, the point of punctuation is so a reader, not, not being able to hear you speak, can sense the cadence of the language and unambiguous communication. They are, they are hearing 
when they read, they're hearing you speaking because of the punctuation. All right, a full stop, that's a period, is a big pause. A comma is a smaller cause, uh, uh, pause, all right? So that's the point of punctuation. We'll talk about that more. I, I did it a lot earlier in, in the series uh, in past years. Anyway, mo moving on. All right, here it is. Based only on this limited data, this data, which is what I gave you at the first, this is an IDH wild type glioblastoma, but it's limited data. You need all eight data spheres, all eight. That's why we have eight. A mimic, a mimic can mimic a, a different tumor in one, maybe two data spheres, not in all eight. So we had a mimicker in the histology for sure, the intravascular fiber microthrombi, but it could not withstand the full imaging with the T2 flare mismatch and the molecular signature characterization. In that situation, those intravascular fibrin microthrombi disappeared. And if you're thinking, well, I see the molecular data and all that stuff, but I'm still going to call it wild type because well, that, that's moronic. All right, is the point made? Yes. Okay, we got to keep moving. We got about nine minutes. We have two more patients to go. Patient two, 45 year old female. All right, Octavio, you're up. There is an intra, um, a intrathecal, intraspinal, extramedullary uh, heterogeneity enhancing mass at the level of the conus medullaris. And uh, I would say that the differential diagnosis would include a mix of papillary ependymoma, a schwannoma, and uh, a clear cell meningioma, a drop met, and much less likely a paraganglioma uh, in that order, you know. Okay. Okay, that, that's very good. Thank you, Octavio. You, 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 that's a very good description. You made one critical error, all right? And we'll talk about it in just a second. Uh, DWI ADC imaging was not performed in this patient, okay? This outside patient. It would have been performed if, if MD Anderson. Other, I'm sure everyone in my audience, all your institutions, it wasn't performed in this particular patient. So I'm going to show you imaging from a different pa from a patient from the literature. I'll give you a citation with DWI ADC which is exactly what this tumor would have looked like on the DWI ADC. You understand? Okay, and it will become clear why as we proceed through the case. All right, here it is. You can see this neuroradiology 2012 by, by Dr. Thurner. All right, and there's the DWI ADC. Our patient's DWI ADC would have looked exactly like this. Octavia, tell us. I would have included a very, very hypercellular tumor like lymphoma there or maybe a drop met of a one of those small brown blue cell tumors up there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. If a hypercellular, when you see that light bulb, restricted diffusion lymphoma has to yeah. be in differential diagnosis. Okay, I like that. Thank you, Octavio. Okay, any, anyone else want to play? Any, anybody else want to play? So more specifically, drop mets from a medulloblastoma. Okay, I like that. I, very creative. Variations on the theme, excellent. Anyone else want to play? Um, did he did he mention uh, an epidermoid cyst? No, yeah, he didn't. Be I, was, yeah. I was going to ask you about that, Octavio. Huh? What is the, what is your explanation for that lacoon, doctor? Uh, with an epidermoid cyst, you would expect a. I, I had in my mind a younger patient with some sort of this spinal dysrhythm. And you know, I what about what about I'll talk about, What about yeah. the huge group of patients when they didn't use cannulas? Yeah, for, yeah, uh, the, for uh, sure. Lumbar, yeah, okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, okay, let's sure. let's, yeah. let's keep going. Let's keep going. Diagnosis. All right. There were four. Listen, there were four or five FFPE blocks from this tumor. It was full. It was completely resecting, gross total resection. Four or five blocks. Four of the five blocks looked exactly like this. All right. Those are anucleate flat squamous cells. All right, yes, the center of this lesion, right, is pure squamous anucleate epithelium. That's like epidermoid. And then here is the lining. Let's go to higher power. So you can see the stratified squamous epithelium. It's got that granular layer. You can see the outer. And then there go the squames shedding the squames. I'll say so the diagnosis, all right. From the data we have so far, this is an epidermoid cyst. All right, it's an epidermoid, fits, restricted diffusion, the whole bit, except for one outlier datum. One outlier datum. All right, let's take a brief vocabulary pause. Data is plural, datum is singular. If you didn't know that, now you do. Let's give some examples of how you use data. <laughs> the data show, not shows. The data show 
yada, yada, yada. The data are congruent with our hypothesis, not the data is. Data is plural. You don't say the data is. The data are. Data is plural. Okay, and I, I just couldn't resist. I had to put this in septum singular. Who knows where this is going? Someone unmute and tell me what I'm gonna what I'm gonna be talking about here. What am I about to say? What what huge error <laughs> do so many? <clears throat> medical people in all fields, how do they mess this up? They don't septa, mess up. Septa and septa. Yeah, tell me about septa, doctor. Septa, uh, septa, tell me about that. How do you, how do you, how do you spell it? Septa is the, uh, S-E-P-T-A is the correct for plural. And then some people add on an E for plural, but that's incorrect. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Gilbert, right on the money. Look, if you guys did not know this, why would you deliberately make yourself look ignorant in public? SEPT? No, seriously, it does not exist. And you see it all the time. It's ignorant. Okay. SEPTA is the plural. Septum, septa, right? So then what is septi or septa, any way you want to say it, it doesn't matter because it does it is pure, unadulterated English illiteracy. Now, let me tell you something. I'm serious about this. There are many of our fellows in the past who were born and raised in China. Chinese is their native language, and they speak better English than our English speakers. They know, many of them know that this is not a word. So if you're a native English speaker, oh, there is no excuse. All right, get your act together. Again, that's why you come to this. You come, and it's fun. It's fun to see it. It's fun to see it in print. It's fun to hear people. When, when the fellows give talks or you're listening to speakers speak and they say T or septa, you know that this is what, that how they would spell it and you're seeing pure ignorance. <laughs> okay, anyway, diagnosis. All right, from the data we have so far, it's an epidermoid cyst, except for one outlier datum. This is not a contrast enhanced. This is T1 without, without contrast. What is that? What is it? What's the problem? This is a T1. This is intrinsic T1 hyperintensity in the rim of the mass. You got two options, either fat or melanin, maybe? Or I, li I, I like it. I like it. So how could you explain it with all the data you have, the histology, everything? How could you make it work? How can, how can you mesh that? You, you could generate the, the, the own separate differential diagnosis. How do you mesh it? Yeah, the, 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 the also a hyperproteinaceous content maybe. Yeah, but, 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 but it's not in the center primarily. It's the rim. It's the rim. It's the yeah. rim. What's in the center? We've already seen the center of the mass, right? Look, look, I can show it to you again. Right here. Where is it? Oh my gosh, I shouldn't even have done this. This is the center of the mass, all that. It's keratin. keratin. There is no yeah. fat in the center of the mass. This T1 intrinsic hyperintensity is in primarily, primarily in the rim. Anyone? Maybe hemorrhage? It's, or... it's, it's fat. Okay. Explain it. Explain it. Okay, that's okay. Here we go. Let's look. Look, now this was, I said there were four or five blocks, four were only keratin. Look at this chunk of tissue here. Let's look at this chunk. That's a hair. A hair. <laughs> All right. This is a dermal uh, cyst. It's a dermal adnexal structure. This is fat. These are sebaceous glands. This is fat. It's deep. It's just in the deep subcutaneous region, the dermal, the dermal region, should say the dermal region of the mass, which would be the periphery. This is the fat. Sebaceous. You, do you like it? So it explains this. That's why it's primarily peripheral, right? So what's your diagnosis? Someone unmute and give me a diagnosis. Dermoid. Is it? A, yeah, yes, dermoid. yes. Dur dermoid, yes. From the data we have so far, this is a dermoid cyst. Yeah, except, no, come on, not again. Seriously, except, except what? It's perfect. Except we haven't examined all of the tissue section in detail. We need all eight data spheres. And here's the point of this. We need all eight data spheres in detail. It means you look at all the sequences, if it's imaging, all the planes, all the sequences. If you have 20 h &E slides, you look at all 20, okay? All right, here's the slide. You wanna back off? Let's back up, let's back up. Whoa, what's all that stuff? That's not keratin. Look at all that stuff deep in the sebaceous glands. Is that keratin? What is it? What, what are we looking at? What is it? Neural tissue. 
Thank you, doctor. Neuroglial tissue. There were islands all over the place of this. What's your diagnosis? Since when is neural tissue part of a dermoid or an epidermoid? What's your diagnosis? Mature teratoma. Done and done. Mature cystic teratoma. Thank you. Did you like this case? Oh, yeah. Here we go. AC stain sections, intradural thoracic spine lesion, yada, 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 associated with dermal adnexal dermoid cyst morphology. That's primarily it. However, multifocal islands, neuroglial tissue also present, as well as possible zincomal endodermal elements, identifying the mass of the teratoma, no immature elements. Uh, diagnosis congruent with, uh, it's a year, I'm, I, I anonymized the year, preoperative MR imaging studies performed referring institution, which we had, shows solitary circumscribed, exactly what Octavio described. There's the measurements, which I took, again, easy, easy breezy uh, to do that. Mass is uh, hyperintensive on 2286 of TSE and STIR, internal structure consistent with uh, keratinous debris, T1 hypointense cent centrally with intrinsic heterogeneous T1 hyperintense peripherals so consistent with ad adnexal structural fat. Okay, all right, we gotta move. I, I think we're one minute over. We have to finish the third patient. I'm gonna make it super fast, five minutes max, I promise. Patient three, 75 year old male, Octavio. A cellar and supracellar mass, which I believe is not, uh, it does not belong or originate from the pituitary gland. Uh, okay. It's tending towards, you know, the chiasm and displacing it, but not quite invading it. Perfect. Try, try these. What sequence are we looking at here? T1 pre and post contrast, it demonstrates homogeneous enhancement. And I'm not quite sure where is it arising from, but I would guess it is from the, it seems to be displaying the, the third ventricular recesses. It's like displacing posteriorly. Okay, the, uh, good, that's good. You wanna have venture a differential diagnosis. I would say that because of the solid appearance and enhancement, I would list in my differential, like in many, a tuberculum sila meningioma, I think, or I, I definitely not a pituitary adenoma. And I would like to see the restricted, the, the, the diffusion to see whether it look it may look like a germinoma or or even a, a lymphoma. I, I, okay. I, I, I would say those three. Okay, I like it, very good. Okay, I don't have an H&E. The H&E was not digitized. Uh, some, sometimes we're supposed to have all the neuro slides. H&Es are digitized, but oftentimes they don't make it. So we always have to check. And if they're not, we have to dot the H&E to make sure. I don't have it. You know, it's okay. This is a, one of the negative immunostains. It's hematoxylin only. It's fine. It is fine. Again, for the pathologist, you don't need H&E. You can do it off the hematoxylin. Some things are even clearer. Sometimes easier to see mitotic figures on the hematoxylin only. Many times when mitotic figures are critical, I can't find them on H&E, I go to the hematoxylin. Sometimes it's sharper, clearer, without all the distraction uh, of, of the protein. All right, anyway, look at look at the, the upper middle half. You see those big foamy cells, those are macrophages, CD163 positive. Not gonna show you the immunostain, we did, we did run it. The, the rest of the field, the lower half, all the way across, small, round, regular, round cells. Here's a TTF1, stone cold negative. Why did I run TTF1, why? Why did I perform a TTF1? Why? Looking for what? Looking for metastatic lung cancer? Looking for metastatic thyroid cancer? Okay. <laughs> Pituous, yeah, that's it, you got it. Okay, you get full, full credit, full credit. Pituocytoma, spinal cell oncocytoma, grain or cell tumor, they may be a family of three, two or more closely related than the third, that's fine. All of these show aberrant intranuclear strong expression of, of TTF1. Just wanted to be thorough. Let's rule out these for sure. You have to do it. All right, super easy. Here's a synaptophysin. Four plus positive every single cell synaptophysin. That's sounding a whole lot like pituitary or neuroendocrine carcinoma, except mitotic figure way down. Here's the FSH whole slide imaging. You can see a dot. You can see the patchy positivity. All right, there you go. You can see individual cells, cytoplasm, four plus positive around the nucleus. This is true, legit follicle stimulating hormone expression by these cells, rare, rare scattered cells with luteinizing hormone positivity. So here it is, what's your diagnosis? What is the diagnosis? Someone's typing. <laughs> is that going into the chat? I can hear your keyboard. <laughs> Okay, here we go. 
I, I'm, I'm going to finish it up because I know the hour's late. Brain, supercellar region, right terrional craniotomy uh, with resection. Okay, now look, if the final diagnosis is going to be gonadotroph adenoma, what would be jarring about this descriptor stem? The final diagnosis is going to be pituitary adenoma, right? We say it's going to be a gonadotroph adenoma. What, what doesn't work with this question, with, with, with the descriptor stem, with pituitary adenoma being right below it? What doesn't work? What's odd? Be a tabula rasa, the scrape plate, right? The, the place we used to do the, the writing, you know, on, on, on the place and you just have to scrape it, scrape it clean, right? Socrates, all that stuff. Tabula rasa, forget about the case you've just seen. What would be odd about this for with pituitary adenoma below it? What would be odd? The surgical approach is Yes, odd. yes, yes, Dr. Gilbert. Yeah, terrional craniotomy. Okay, well, the, the obvious reason, I mean, you, you, you put it together. The reason is because there was no cellar component. Octo, Octavio called that dead on, straight on. It's pure supracellar. Why would you want to go through the pituitary to get to the supracellar region? But it's, a, it's a far reach. You probably wouldn't be able to get it all anyway. So the neurosurgeon did a terrional approach to access the supracellar region for the tumor. All right, now check this out. h &E stain section, cellular neoplasm, uniform pot, round epithelioid cells, nest, stromal uh, population of macrophages. Why? Well, this is the supracellar region. It's not in the cella. So it's not behaving like it were in the cella. Ectopic tumors, ectopic glioblastoma, metastatic glioblastoma to bone, to, to wherever, to lungs. It's not gonna look exactly like it looks in, in the brain, its native environment. Mitotic activity, inconspicuous. Uh, uh, the uh, KI67, 3%, all right, overall too. It's not a neuroendocrine carcinoma, not with that, okay? That fits with pituitary adenoma beautifully, all right? Differentiates more human phenotyping, shows uh, tumor cell expression of synaptophycin, patchy expression of keratin, did, did not show you that. Keratin uh, cocktail, you must specify, you should, if you wanna be first class, you can't just say pan keratin, put in exactly what it is. This is the keratin cocktail that we use uh, at MD Anderson. Tumor cells negative for TTF1, CD163 with the latter marker highlighting the macrophages. And here's the uh, pituitary uh, hormone immunophenotyping, positive patchy multifocal for FSH and rare scattered LH. That's exactly what gonadotroph uh, adenomas look like. They virtu virtually never have diffuse, strong, positively like you might see in, uh, in, in other uh, tumors. Diagnosis gonadotroph adenoma congruent with pre-op imaging studies performed for an institution. We, which we can see show contrast enhancing mass in the supracellar region per communication with the patient's neurosurgeon doctor. Yeah, you can figure it out. Plus every, everyone, everyone knows who, who does 99.9% .9 of the pituitary adenomas in MD Anderson Cancer Center. That's a really long name, isn't it? The adenoma was located exclusively in the supracellar compartment with no connection to the intracellular pituitary gland. And in addition, the tumor was only loosely adherent to the pituitary stalk, lifting away from it easily making an origin from the pars tuberalis, which would be the most common origin for exclusively ect ectopic supracellar pituitary adenoma, which I mean, they're, they're rare, but not that rare. They arise from the pars tuberalis, which is the part of the adenohypoxis, which surrounds the infundibulum, right? Going up. That's, yeah, sure. Easy breezy. Second most common location for ectopic pituitary adenoma is a supracellar region. Question, question. Oh, what is the most common location for ectopic pituitary adenoma. Someone unmute and tell me the most common location. Ooh, sound of crickets? Sphenoid sinus, sphenoid sinus. If you didn't know that, now you do. All right, this may, listen. Oh, this is so sweet. This is why we had to cover this case. It's worth missing a few minutes or whatever. This may therefore represent an instance of the rare but well-documented origin a pituitary adenoma from, from what? There's no connection to the stalk or the pituitary from a supracellular peri-infundibular adenohypophyseal tissue rest. Did you even know they existed? If you didn't, now you do. Phenomenally rare, but well-recognized. And guess what? We just had one for real live at MD Anderson Cancer Center. <laughs> you like that? And there's a the reference. All right. Of course, I showed it to the expert, head neck, Dr. Andrew Bell. I wanted to make sure I wasn't missing, you know, a neuroendocrine carcinoma, something like that. Maybe they could have, et cetera, et cetera. Dr. Bell says, you know, no, you're right. This is exactly what it is. All right. Here we go. Gonadotroph adenoma. Yeah. Okay. Is this, is this all my diagnosis? And then there's going to be the hormone stuff and a comment. Is that okay? 
What, what about that right terrional craniotomy? You, you, should I let that stand just with, oh, oh, gonadotroph adenoma? Sure, we take those out all the time by terrional approach. No, you know I didn't leave it like that. Here it is. Ectopic supracellular periinfundibular gonadotroph adenoma. All right, and then here's, here's that, and then we go to the references. Let's look at the references. Uh, this is the locus classicus for these adenohypophyseal rests. Supracellular ectopic periinfundibular adenohypophysis in fetal and adult brains, 1985. This is not like it was described last month. Huh? There it is. Uh, and then I'll just, I'll, let me give you his follow-up paper, 1999, immunohistical survey, migration, human anterior pituitary cells, yada, yada, yada. He just expanded on that uh, hypothesis. He basically discovered he deserves a recognition. Uh, after the original uh, uh, 1985 paper by Dr. Horry, uh, Colahan, uh, ectopic pituitary gland tissue simulating a supertrial tumor. So these re the rest in this particular uh, patient, it was not an adenoma. It was just the ectopic gland, the adenohypophyseal tissue, was large enough to be visualized as a tumor. How's that? 1987. All right. Okay. Yita, uh, supercellular perianfidigure, ectopic prolinoma, uh, prolactinoma confirmed not arising from the pars tuberalis exactly like our case, all right, 2003. All right, you like that? All right, this is the preoperative imaging. Would you like to see the post-operative imaging? Yes, of course. Beautiful. The mass is gone, gross total resection, easy breezy, and look at that stalk, perfect. No disruption of the stalk, no disruption of the, this, this is almost like a, a, a partial empty cell, but that's a pituitary gland doing fantastic, no hormonal aberrations. That's why you come to a place like MD Anderson Cancer Center and a surgeon like Dr. Ian McCutcheon, all right, is because you're gonna get this from a surgeon who lives and breathes pituitary adenomas, you know, of, of every flavor and variety for an entire career spanning, I don't know what, 30 years, yeah, something, something like that. That's why you go to the expert, a perfect outcome. Okay, let's finish. If you did not know about supercellular perianfundibular subarachnoid space adenohypophyseal chill rests, or, <laughs> okay, or that they can give rise to ectopic supercellular perianfundibular pituitary adenoma, you are not yet a diagnostic medicine physician, not fully mature, neither am I, join the club, and you must continue to attend the MDCC, IDMCC. Here's the good news. Next conference is locked and loaded Friday, June 11, 6 a.m. And with that, uh, we will finish at 7.13. I apologize for the overrun, but I think you're gonna have to agree it was worth it for that last case. Thanks to everyone for, for attending and I will end the conference here and let all of us get to work. Thank, thank you, you for so attending. Much. Oh, Thanks, my, Dr. Fuller, thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for attending. It was an honor to speak before this group. Thank you, Greg. That was great. My pleasure. Thank you for your kind comments.